Okay, so we've been uh, starting the um, sort of journey to finally calculate the band structure of silicon. Um, just showing the orbitals, the bases we're going to be using, and the various types of bonds that they form. So the various types of the orbitals we're going to be using, the S and the P orbitals, the bonds that they form, defining them in terms of well, these Y, these spherical harmonics, and then how the spherical harmonics relate to the final basis uh, set of PZ, PX, PY, PZ orbitals that we actually use. And then last time we defined the um, matrix elements uh, that we're going to need. And then you can look up in tables like... Uh, uh, basically the famous Slater-Coster tables, which are uploaded on iLearn, uh, the original paper by Slater and Coster. So we, I mean, these are, everything will be written in terms of these uh, matrix elements that we defined here, that be SS sigma, SP sigma, SP, uh, PP sigma, and PP pi. Um, so then uh, we started setting up the problem to um, finally calculate the Hamiltonian matrix elements. The first thing we had to do was just um, define our uh, coordinate system, which is easy for your cubic semiconductor. Um, know where the two atoms are in your primitive unit cell that are going to repeat to make the entire crystal. And these are where they are, this A and B atom. And what did we do? And then we showed how to calculate the matrix elements between that A and B atom for the various uh, type of orbital combinations that occur between S, P, and P, P orbitals. And how these, all these matrix elements between the A and the B atom and the various P orbitals and S orbitals can be written in terms of some combination of what we defined earlier, this, uh, you know, PP sigma, PP pi, SP sigma, etc., with some, with some uh, multiplied by some direction cosines. These were the direction cosines. The cosines of that D vector that connects the B atom to the is D vector. So these are the direction cosines of that D vector with your X, Y, and Z axis, uh, your L, M, and N, the direction cosines, cosine of those angles. And also they're the, I mean, they are the components of your unit vector in the D direction. Your unit vector in the D direction is just that. So we went through the various type of, uh, okay, all our the matrix elements we're going to need. Um, and, now, and then we sort of started, we defined what our um, primitive lattice vectors are. So now we're doing this in 3D. And before we were just working on a, we had a 1D crystal. Now we're going to have a 3D crystal. And so there are three primitive lattice vectors that define the periodicity in 3D space. It's A1, A2, and A3, and they are the vectors uh, connecting our origin, the A atom at 0, 0, 0, to the three face atoms. One at this face here, one underneath, and one around the back side. Those three vectors. And so any, any translation by a linear combination of these three vectors uh, just brings you back to an equivalent point in the lattice. Um, and so when we we're going to be writing sums over all these when we write these sums over all these lattice vectors it's equivalent to what we were doing in 1D when we wrote sums over n where n were all the you know, unit cells along our line now r will be in r is all the unit cells in 3D space so we're again summing over all the primitive unit cells in 3D space. 
the fundamental repeat unit that defines a lattice. So when you see these sums over R, this is the sum over all the primitive unit cells in the 3D space, and each unit cell is going to contain two atoms, an A atom and a B atom. Just like in your homework, where each unit cell contained two atoms, an A atom and a B atom, but you know, there they're all in a line. Now they're all in 3D space. Okay, so um, I guess the next thing we're going to do is define our basis, our block sum basis, in which we're then going to calculate the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. So, okay, our block sum basis. So, I guess the first question, how many, how many elements are going to be in this basis? You know, in your homework, you've got two elements, right? A of K and B of K. So what are we going to have now? Four on the A atom and four on the B atom. So we're going to have eight. Eight elements in our basis, and each one is going to be a block sum. So our block sum basis is going to be take your s orbital on the a atom and form the block sum of those orbitals on those atoms. So formally, it's going to look like what we've been doing, except instead of the sum over little n, we now have this sum over all primitive unit cells in the lattice, which is the sum over big R. The s orbital on the A atom in each primitive cell, right, that's the s orbital on the A atom in prim primitive cell R, times the phase factor associated with that primitive cell. And in this case, I'm going to include that extra phase factor that we didn't include in the homework, but I'm going to include that for the B atom. So, so I'm putting the A atoms on the lattice sites where I'm putting the A atoms where R is, defining R is where the A atom is in each primitive cell. And then, um, um, okay, so we do this for the uh, four um, orbitals on atom A. So we've got one for the S, one for PX, and they're all going to look the same, the same kind of sum. I just replace each orbital by its own type in the sum. And the phase factor is just a function of the atom position, so for all the orbitals on the A atom, they have the same phase factor. And these are now three-dimensional Ks. Uh, let's see, A. Oh, this should be an R in here. I'm sorry. These are all Rs. I'm summing over position R. Okay, so those are the uh, four uh, block sums for the four orbitals on the A atom. And then we do um, the four for the B atom. And the only difference is they're going to have this extra phase factor um, because they're offset by this uh, vector A over 4, 1, 1, 1. So these are for the A atom. And then for the B atom, we've got those four orbitals. Again, the sum looks the same because that's uh, the index for the unit, the primitive cell that it's in. The only thing, the only difference is the phase factor. And so now, since this V is going to be that A over 4, A over 4, 1, 1, 1, quarter, 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 the offset in 3D space of the B atom from the uh, A atom. And we have the Y and the Z. And this V is our uh, offset of A over 4. One, 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 quarter away along the diagonal of the cube. So for every you know primitive cell R, you've got two atoms: the A atom that's sitting at point R, and the B atom that's sitting at R plus B. Okay, and then you sum over them all. So those that's our that's our eight by eight basis, and in that basis we now need to calculate the matrix elements of H in this basis. And so we're going to go ahead and start doing that. Just like we did in 1D, once you have your basis, then you take your matrix elements of the Hamiltonian and construct your 8 by 8 matrix. So we'll start with, what do we want to start with? 
I guess the diagonal ones are always the easiest ones. But it looks like I didn't start with a diagonal. Okay, I started with an off diagonal. So I started with the easiest one, off diagonal, which is between the two S states. So I'm looking at um, an S on the A atom and an S on the B atom. So I'm looking at that matrix element. The Hamiltonian matrix element between an S orbital on the A atom or the block sum of those two orbitals. And so again, just like we, we did in 1D, we have to expand that out to evaluate it back in terms of the definitions of these block sum. So that's 1 over n, sum over Ra, sum over Rb. And that doesn't mean the position of the A and B atom. I'm just two different R's to keep separate. So, all right, the R always is the, is the, is the position of the A atom and just is a, sort of the, our index for the primitive cell. S A R A H S B R B times the phase factors e to the i k dot R B plus V minus R A. So the RB plus V is due to the ket, and the sign of this is negative because we're taking the complex conjugate of this guy, right? So the phase factor of this guy is complex conjugated, just like what we did in 1D. And so you get the minus, the difference, the difference of the two phase factors, because you're always complex conjugating one. So that's what we need to evaluate. And we're going to do it, you know, the concept is exactly like what we did in 1D, it's just now we got to do it in 3D. So we're going to fix one of them. We'll fix RA, the outer loop, and do the inner loop. So fix RA equal to the origin. So that's the A atom at the origin. And then we do the sum over RB. And the uh, reason this is doable is because we're still working in a nearest neighbor model. I mean, it's, it's doable in any case as long as you have some finite number of neighbors, but it makes it much easier. It's nearest neighbor because there's going to be four nearest neighbors. So we just need to know where the four nearest B atoms are with respect to that A atom at the origin. And those are the only ones that are going to give us a non-zero matrix element. So that sum over R B will only have four terms in it. Just like in 1D, it only had two terms, the one to the right and the one to the left. Now it's going to have four terms to the four nearest neighbors, four nearest B atoms to the A atoms. So we just now have to figure out where they are. Where are those four nearest neighbors? Once we know that, we can do the sum. So... Um, the position of these four nearest neighbors are Rb plus V, right? That is the position of the B atom for any R sub B. That's going to be the position of the corresponding B atom for that primitive cell. And that is the four nearest neighbors to uh, the origin are, are what? So A over 4. Uh, 1, 1, 1, which is the one we've been talking about, that quarter away along the diagonal, which is the one in, in the pr same primitive cell as A. Those two are in the same primitive cell. A over 4, uh, 1, negative 1, negative 1, uh, negative 1, uh, 1, negative 1, and the fourth one is a over four, uh, negative one, negative one, one. And for any a atom, you know, for any a atom, if we choose any a atom as the origin, these are going to be, with respect to the a atom, these are going to be where the uh, corresponding four b atoms are. And before we talked about the direction vector, 
from the A atom to the B atom. So these define the four direction vectors for uh, the point from the A atom to, his four, to the four nearest neighbors for any A atom. So we're going to call, define this as D1. Right, now there's going to be four direction vectors because there's four nearest neighbors, D2, D3, and D4. And then once you do the sum you know, over these, over R sub B, over the B atoms, just like in your 1D problem, you know, all points RA are identical. And so just like in your 1D problem, after you do the sum over R sub B, you're going to be left with this. And the argument is not going to be a function of RA. And so this, the sum, will just cancel the 1 over N. So that sum over RA just cancels your normalization 1 over N just like in the 1D problem. So once we do the sum over the four nearest neighbors, we're done. So now we just go ahead and do that. For every one of these um, four B atoms, remember the uh, this matrix element is not a function of the angle. And the only thing that's changing is you know the respective angle of the, B at the one B atom with respect to the A atom. And so for all cases, this is simply um, R, V, S, S, sigma. That matrix element is our V, S, S, sigma. Due to an S orbital on the A atom and an S orbital on the B atom. Two S orbitals. Their orientation doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is their distance, and the distance is the same for all the nearest neighbors. If I wanted to try to draw where these, I don't know if I can draw this. It's like... You've got if you got your central atom, your central A atom, and it's this what they call tetragonal configuration. So you'd have like two up here, and I think maybe like two into the page, the one bigger, and so two going the other way, something like that for the four nearest neighbors. I'm going to write my K as a normalized K, so I'm going to write K. I'm going to take out the factor of 2 pi over a. So this simply defines what I mean by kx, ky, kz. They're normalized. The, the components I'm writing, I'm taking out the 2 pi, factoring out the 2 pi over a, and so just being left with these kx, ky, kz, which are normalized components. They actually have no units once I factor out the 2 pi over a. Um, and if I do, do it like that, then... You know, I'm going to have. Let's look at the first phase for, uh, for the for for my um, what do I want to call it for B. Call it my first B that we listed, where this was our D1, and D1 was just a over four one one one. So then I'm going to have a phase factor of e to the i two pi over a times a over 4, uh, 1, 1, 1, dotted into kx, ky, kz. I believe that's correct. And so the a's cancel off, and uh, I'm going to be left with a phase factor of e to the i, uh, pi over 2, times kx plus ky plus KZ. Did I get that right? Yes, I did. That is correct. So that would be the phase factor I get from the first atom at 1, 1, 1. And so if we go back and look at the... So I've got 1, 1, 1. These are the four, the four different positions. So if I come back here, I'm going to... Uh, and I sum over those four different positions, I'm going to get V, S, S, Sigma times the four phase factors, e to the i, pi over 2, kx plus ky plus kz, plus e to the i, pi over 2. And my next position is 1, negative 1, negative 1. So that just gives me 
two negative signs, kx minus ky minus kz for the atom at d2 plus e to the i pi over 2 times. And the next atom is at negative 1, 1, negative 1. So it'll be negative kx plus ky minus kz. And the last one is at negative 1, negative 1, 1. So it'll be e to the i pi over 2 times negative kx minus ky plus kz. So that's what this matrix element is. This is the sum over the four nearest neighbors. They all have the same magnitude, VSS sigma, and they have these different phase factors just due to their different positions. Taking um, and, and the different positions, this, RB plus V minus RA, this vector up here, this is just the d vector for that particular um, atom that I'm nearest neighbor that I'm summing over. That's just the vector that points from the a atom to the b atom. So the sum, sum over the four nearest neighbors is really just a sum over those four d vectors up there in the exponent. So that's k dot d. And we're going to quickly start writing it like that. So this is the simplest one. Nothing funny is happening because VSS sigma, the matrix element itself, um, doesn't depend on the angle. Its sign is always whatever its sign is, uh, negative, I guess. Um, and the only thing going on is you've got this sum of four phase factors. Uh, the sum of the four phase factors are always going to have the exact same form. The only thing that's going to differ is the sign out front is going to change once we start looking at the p orbital. So now let's do that. Let's look at a p orbital. Um, so let's look at SA. So we're keeping S atom. An S orbital on the A atom and put a PX orbital on the B atom. And again, you expand that out. That's 1 over N sum RA sum RB matrix element uh, times the phase factor. And as we said, this is just the d vector that goes from atom A to atom B. And again, we fix our A at 0. So that's 0. And so the sum over RB is just the sum over the uh, d vectors of the four nearest neighbors. Sum over the there's four d, d vectors of the nearest neighbors. And so this sum, this this matrix element is simply um, sum i equal 1 to 4 s a at 0, 0, 0 h p x b at position d sub i uh, e to the i k dot d sub i. Now it looks a lot simpler. That is your matrix element. That's the whole deal right there. Sum i equal 1 to 4. Sum over your four nearest neighbors times the four phase factors. All right? That's all it is. Yeah? I didn't understand. Um, how did you normalize the k? I just wrote it like, like this. I just defined this. I mean, k is k. What I'm doing is defining what I mean by kx, ky, and kz. Right? That defines what I mean by kx, ky, and kz. I mean, k is k. 
in, in back in our 1D problem, you know, k was a continuous variable that went from uh, minus pi over a to plus pi over a, right? For 1D, that was our k variable. Yes, well, I, did, I didn't understand that, that fact that could be 2 pi over a. I just defined it like that. I can, I can, I could, what this, so k, so for the, here's k, right? Here's k. And then you ask, well, this is in 1D, what is kx? k in 1D is kx x hat, right? And I'm defining a new kx, which is 2 pi over a, I'll call it kx prime, x hat. So these are these are these prime variables in there. What's that? It's a new variable. What? It's a new variable. A new what? Variable. It's a new variable, but it's it's normalized and it's now unitless. Right? Those kx, ky, and kz have no units now. I took the units out. Right? K has units of one over length, right? but I'm putting the units of one over length explicitly out in the front of the the components. So kx, ky, and kz now are these dimensionless variables, and I do that to make the exponents here look nice and get rid of all the a's that would be flying around. All right. Well, at any rate. This is the way we've defined it, so we all know what, what we have here. And you'll see, it's just going to keep the notation simpler. And at the end, since these are all phase factors, there'll be some in interesting cancellations. And, and uh, this is what happens at the high symmetry points, which we'll see in a, in a little bit. But first of all, we've got to calculate what they are. So this is, I mean, this is going to be the form for all the matrix elements that we calculate, it reduces to this form. A sum over the four nearest neighbors, your phase factor, just e to the i k dot d, where d is that position of the nearest neighbor with respect to the origin. Just putting the a atom at the origin, and then go ahead and calculate the matrix that matrix element. So now these phase factors are going to be like the same four phase factors that we had here, but the matrix element itself is now going to be a function of the angle, and the sine will start flipping around because we had these direction cosines, and the direction cosines are simple. The sine of the direction cosines are simply the sine of the component in the x, y, and z direction. So as those signs change. Um, those are your direction cosines, um, and the sine of the matrix element will start flipping. So let's look at that and see what we get. Um, this matrix element is equal to um, L, which is the direction cosine of the d vector with the x axis, right? L times V. S, P, sigma. That's what that matrix element is. The direction cosine of the d vector with the x-axis. And that direction cosine of the d vector is just equal to um, dx, the x component of the d vector, over the magnitude of d. And we know that you know the magnitude of dx over d for every Every term is the same, and that is simply our uh, 1 over square root of 3. Right, so the magnitude of this thing out front is just 1 over square root of 3, but the sign is going to change. And the sign will depend on the sign of the x component of, of d. So the sign will correspond to the sign of the x component of d. Right? And so that's the sign of the matrix element is going to follow the... the uh, sine of the x component of d. So that becomes, let me write down what we're calculating, sa, 
So that is equal to 1 over root 3. That was the magnitude of dx over the magnitude of d. dx is like 1, 1, 1 over root 3 dx hat times v s p sigma, which is the magnitude of the matrix element, times my four phase factors. So e to the i k dot d1 plus e to the i k dot d2 minus, because d the x component of d3 was negative, minus e to the i k dot d3, and the x component of d4 is negative also, so minus e to the i k dot d4, right? So the sign, this, this matrix element was L V S P sigma times your phase factor e to the i k dot d and L was dx over d and, um, and the magnitude of d is square root of 3. If we just think of d hat, work with d hat. Right, so. And so the, so the sign of, you know, I put the sign inside here. So the sign of this is just because d3 hat has the sign of the x component of d3 is negative, and the, uh, the sign of dx of, uh, for d4 is, is negative. So you get two negative signs, two positive signs. And what you can immediately see here is at the gamma point, when k equals 0, this matrix element disappears. We're going to see a lot of that. So you start off with this full 8 by 8 Hamiltonian, but at special points in k space, high symmetry points, a lot of the matrix elements disappear. Okay, and these, these four phase factors are identical to these four where did they go? These four phase factors. All the phase, what's in the exponent never changes. So let me just write that out one more time and maybe I won't write it out after. Maybe I probably won't bother after that. So one last time, writing everything out. Same phase factors as before, it's just now we're going to start getting minus signs in front of some of them. Okay, but what's in the exponent is going to be the same because that's only a function of the position of the four atoms, which is always the same, irrespective of what orbitals you're considering. And again, our, just to reemphasize, these kx, ky, kz's are a normalized kx, ky, kz. Once we have that, all the other sp orbitals you can... Um, pretty much immediately write down replacing it's just the direction cosine of the d vector with you know if it's a py orbital with the y axis or a pz orbital with the z axis so once you've written down one it's pretty easy to write down the rest so s a k h y that's equal to um, sum over, uh, let's write this as a sum over D, your four nearest neighbors, SA at the origin, and your PY at position D, your four nearest neighbor D vectors times E to the IK dot D. So the only difference between this and the last one is this matrix element is now M, <coughs> V, sp sigma, which is the y component of your d vector, dy over d, magnitude of d, uh, v sp sigma. 
And so now the sine is just going to depend on, on the sine of the dy component of your uh, uh, d vector. So we just look at the what those four position vectors were again. Uh, where did they go? Here they are. And well, we see the sine of d2 and d4, the, the dy component for d2 and d4 is negative. So those two will have a, a negative sign in d1 and d3. The sign of the dy component there is positive, so they'll have a positive sign. I mean, in all cases, you're going to get two positives and two negatives. So all these sp matrix elements are going to disappear when k equals 0, because the phase factor will be 1 plus 1 minus 1 minus 1 when k equals 0. And, and what you immediately see is if there's no matrix element between an, any s orbital and any p orbital, those two subspaces decouple. And you're going to have a little s subspace, and you're going to have a p subspace with no matrix elements. In which, and that's why the conduction band is purely s type at k equals 0, and the valence band is purely p type, because there's no coupling at k equals 0. We'll get to that. OK, so this is equal to. And similarly for the last sp matrix element, right, where this direction cosine is what we n sub i is. OK, and again, uh, the sign will be negative wherever um, dz is negative. So you go back and you see, OK, where is dz negative? And so dz is negative for d2 and d3 and positive for d1 and d4. And so that's how the signs will end up. So this is, again, magnitudes are all the same. V, S, P, sigma over root 3 times your phase factors, E to the I, K dot D1 minus E to the I, K dot D2 minus E to the I, K dot D3 and plus e to the i k dot d4. And we've got all our s, p matrix elements. And this guy. OK, and as we see, they're all going to disappear at k equals 0, all the sp matrix elements. Uh, the next thing are the pp, the matrix elements between the various p orbitals. So let's start off with putting an x atom on the a and an x atom on the b. So x, a. OK, an x on the a and an x on the b. That's going to equal sum over your four nearest neighbors. And the matrix element was uh, between a, an x atom on uh, an x, px on the a and px on the b was this l sub i squared v p p sigma plus 1 minus L sub i squared uh, V P P pi. And then, of course, times your phase factors. Right. This, this was a form of the matrix element between that we had for um, an x px on an A and P, px on a B. And we did it, in, and we got it in terms of L, but you know now this L is going to be a function of which um, B atom we're looking at. But since all the Ls are squared, you'll see, you see that the sign of this, right, this is always, the sign is not going to be flopping around on this because you always have L squared. So, and since the magnitudes are the same, it's, the magnitude of L is always 1 over root 3. Uh, nothing happens here. It looks just like when we had two S orbitals. Uh, you're not going to get any 
disappearance at k equals 0. So this is equal to, so uh, you know, L squared is uh, 1 third. Um, 1 minus L squared is 2 thirds. So I'm going to put my 1 third out front. 1 third times V P P sigma minus 2 V P pi times my four phase factors. Okay, nothing funny is going on with the sign here. They're all positive because all the uh, direction cosines are squared. And also we got between an x and a y. So that's an x and an x. Um, and this is, let's see, uh, this is, so the matrix, this will be the same matrix, between the x and the x will also be the exact same matrix element as between a y and a y and a z and a z. Because if I replace L squared by M squared, or by N squared, that's still just one third. Right, they're all one third. So this is also equal to um, y a k h y b k, which is also equal to z a k h z b. So we've got all of those taken care of. Now we need two different type of uh, p orbitals, like an x and a y, for example. Okay, so we'll look at putting an x on the a atom and a y on the b atom. So again, sum over your four nearest neighbors. And this matrix element was L times M, so Li Mi times V P P sigma minus V P P pi times your phase factors. And that's what well, that's what we derived for this and putting an X on an A, a Y on a B, it was L M times this difference in V P P sigma minus V P P pi. Um, and well now since you're not now it's going to depend on the product of L and M, the sign, and that does change, right? So if we go back and look at our direction vectors, uh, if we're looking at the product of L and M, so where the heck are they? These guys, L and M. So the X and the Y. So for example, you know, L and M for this guy would be negative because it's a product of the DX and DY term. L times M for this guy would be negative and for this guy be positive, and for this guy be positive. So again, you're going to get two negatives, two positives, so this term will also disappear at k equals zero. So that's equal to one-third, because both L and M are one over root three, the magnitude, times V P P sigma minus V P pi times my sum of the phase factors e to the i k dot d1 minus e to the i k dot d2 minus e to the i k dot d3 plus e to the i k dot d4. So the um, again, once you've got one of these, you can immediately write down the others. So for example, if we do without just writing down what the sum looks like. So if I did X and Z, for example, right, the only thing that's going to change, I replace L and M with L and N. So this would be equal to sum I equal 1 to 4. L, I, N sub I. So now I'd be looking at the sign of the uh, X and Z components of the D vector times the same V, P, P. Sigma minus V P P pi times my phase factors e to the i. And uh, I won't 
bother to write that out. Um, and so if I were to do put a Y orbital on the A, uh, Z on the B, I would just replace the L now by M. So I'd have M sub I, N sub I, the same difference, V, P, P sigma minus V, P, P pi times the phase factors, e to the i, k dot d i. Okay, so that's, um, that's pretty much all we need, and next time we'll construct the Hamiltonian and start looking at it at the high symmetry points. Uh, and discussion Friday. Um, so the homework will be due, and we'll discuss. Uh, so while I'm, as I said before, while I'm doing silicon, you guys will be doing graphene, since it's only two-dimensional. There's only three nearest neighbors. It's a little easier, and only one type of orbital. So I'll do silicon, you do graphene. And graphene is cooler, right? Silicon's old. <laughs>